everyone. I'm Kat Sheridan. I'm the director of the Ohio Arts Council's Bright Gallery. And today I'm really pleased to share with you Tracy Reader, the curator of the exhibition here, Expanded Dimensions, Quilt and Design Symposium 2020. Um, quilt and Surface Design, I'm so sorry. Quilt and Surface Design Symposium 2020. Um, so without further ado, Tracy's really got the goods on this show. I'm going to let her talk about the artists and the behind the scenes and how this came to be. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm the director of the Quilt and Surface Design Symposium, and I've been doing that for uh, 21 years now. Uh, the symposium has been going on for, uh, last year was supposed to be our 31st year. We did have to cancel, but uh, we are keeping our fingers crossed and uh, that this coming year is going to be a go. Um, so I, for this exhibition, I selected 10 artists. And I kind of had free reign as to what kind of exhibition that I wanted to put together. Um, the only stipulation was that these artists had to uh, be participants in the past of QSDS. So needless to say, I had a vast sea of incredibly talented artists to choose from. Um, I started with my title, Expanded Dimensions, um, because in the 21 years that I have been doing QSDS, I've seen such a transformation of the artwork from one thing and how it's transformed and evolved and um, into something completely different, uh, a more contemporary, a, um, a thinking outside the box, thinking away from the wall, um, you know, installation. Uh, kind of body of work and to me that is so exciting that I was able to be on the forefront and experience that So uh, these are some of the artists that I have selected So if we want to go ahead and get started, we are going to start right over here with a Columbus artist named Deborah Griffin I met Deborah Griffin at uh, CCAD, the Columbus College of Art and Design, and um, she also works at the Goodwill Studios. And that is a place uh, where she creates art with people with disabilities. And um, so she got her degree in ceramics. She also got uh, her MFA in painting. So two very different uh, kind of mediums, one very hands-on textile or uh, tactile and one very two-dimensional, um, you know, so very different. Um, she still feels as though she's kind of two different artists in one person and that's something that she's really working to kind of bring together and she feels that in this exhibition she uh, has come closer to that than, than in any other exhibition. Um, on her collage pieces, um, she, it's more, her imagery comes from, um, she likes to think about how people's brains work. Um, in her family, she has, uh, she had a mother with Alzheimer's, a brother with schizophrenia, and it's always been on the forefront of her brain. Um, and she says, you know, she claims that she has OCD, like many of us artists do, and, um, and that she has always wondered, okay, we see the same thing, but we have different realities. And so sometimes with each piece, she is imagining what does this person's reality look like. Um, she enjoys um, doing her work. We're going to come to these real quick. These are her small sculptures. Uh, with her small sculptures, she enjoys uh, using recycled materials, materials that have had a past life. So when she creates these new pieces, that they not only have the life that they are living now as her object de art, but also the past life that they had. They bring the energy from the people that they did belong to. She works a lot with stream of consciousness and she works a lot with um, 
doing a drawing and then maybe setting it in the outside and letting nature and time kind of change the piece. And then once she sees the changes, she enjoys going back in and seeing how that will influence her to change her work. It's easy to see in here some of the watermarks that she's changed into other shapes. And that's just her reaction to the time, to space, to, um, you know, how this person's brain has worked, to her stream of consciousness thought. And it's very obvious in this piece. You can see the watermarks. So Tracy, she has a really interesting way of, of this additive thought process and um, mark making process. So talk to me a little bit about how you see those two things aligning when you stitch something together, when you stitch thoughts together, when you create larger pictures. Um, help narrate to us what you think is going on in these pieces. She sees, um, she sees a, a a great deal of similarities between the infrastructure of the world, meaning building structures, man-made um, metal, you know, maybe a street light, and how that can relate to um, and have similar shape and image to, say, a tree. Um, and so that's kind of how her stream of consciousness may go. So she may start by building um, and drawing buildings, but then that may kind of transfer into a tree. Um, and you can see on this piece where she obviously felt that she needed um, some more dimension to this. So she's actually, this is one of uh, the pieces that she added a lot of fabric and stitching onto. And, um, and she always has uh, like a lot of industrial pieces. Um, you know, because industrial pieces, they, they um, every bolt and every nut has to be in place in order for that to work, and which is very similar to a brain and how that works. Um, if you have one, let's say, nut or bolt or um, synapse, maybe that's out of, of, that's not working quite right, that can make it work in a totally different way. So... All right, and this was Debbie Griffin, and yes. um, we have a comment from Kimberly Chapman said, uh, this artist is incredible, so multi-talented. Yes, so. definitely, definitely. Let's move to Mary Ann Tipple. Okay. This is Mary Ann Tipple, and she is from Elyria, Ohio. Um, the reason I picked her for this exhibition is she was one of the first artists um, at QSDS to figure out how to use large photo images in her pieces. Um, and this was way before, uh, you know, the large printers um, that where you can print fabric out. This, this occurred before then. She figured out how to do it on a copy machine and kind of transfer that to the, the um, pieces. And since then, it's kind of moved into more of a, a memorial kind of genre, I believe, that each of these are a memorial of a special person in her life. Um, this piece, she has pieces of, of clothing, um, maybe images of something that we don't know quite what those mean or whose clothes these were, but it adds to the composition. And um, I feel, and she says that she's kind of started going that way because just the images of the people are interesting, but they may not mean a lot to the general public. So in order to um, you know, bring more interest from the general public, she's been working more on the composition um, so that other, piece, other people will enjoy the piece as a whole. Um, she does use a lot of words, kiss me before you go, make it long enough to last forever. These were her parents, the X's and the O's, materials from their clothing. Um, this piece over here is her mother. 
very simple black and white. She's gone to almost the pixelated imagery. A lot of stitching. Yeah, Tracy, talk a little bit about that stitching because some of it, the quilting that puts all of the layers together really kind of follows some contours and adds interest. Yes, yes. And um, that's another thing that's kind of been um, newer in the I would say the art quilt world is, is a long arm sewing machine, which gives people a lot more versatility, versatility to kind of do more freeform and more intense, um, 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 you know, quilting on the pieces. Um, you know, you can go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So the quilting lines actually become much more of a, a part of the piece. Um, this piece right here, I find this one's very interesting. I don't know the background between this, but I find it very interesting that he almost has a bullseye on his face, and it makes you wonder, who is this to her, and why does he have, you know, that bullseye? Or perhaps a third eye. Right, exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I believe these memorial pieces also... Um, reflect back on a more traditional um, usage of art quilts when they were used for memorials. You know, when you would use somebody who's passed away, use their clothes, and so that you would always have a memento of them. And um, so to me, they were very special. She made one of my grandparents for me, and um, it, yeah, it's very, very, very special. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. Let's go have a look at Sue Cavanaugh. Okay, Sue Cavanaugh is another artist from Columbus, Ohio. And Sue got her start uh, doing two-dimensional art quilts on the wall uh, until she took a three-month um, residency in the Netherlands. And there she worked in a very large industrial building and uh, her studio overlooked a large central courtyard, um, two-story tall uh, gallery. And it was her goal before she left that she was going to create a piece that would um, be able to utilize that whole space. That was her goal. So she had to figure out what kind of work or what kind of material she could use. And um, she found recycled parachutes. So, um, she has done a great job finding recycled parachutes. This piece is called SOS to the World. To the Universe. To the universe. I'm sorry, SOS to the Universe. And as you can see here, we have the dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 which is the SOS. Um, she also has some back here. And looking from this side, you can't quite see it, but this right here is a large S. We have a white column here, which is an O. And then this huge, large piece against the back wall is another S. These are parachutes made out of uh, recycled parachutes and sheer fabrics. Um, with this piece, she's kind of, no, she's not kind of, she is. She's calling out to the universe to help us. Um, this piece right here represents the tsunamis that have hit different places in the world. We have a red drawing back here behind that she did that represents the fires in Australia. Um, I, I hope that it can pick it up, but beautifully here in the gallery we can kind of see through this, the lighting is beautiful, but the plastics that are choking the ocean um, through here. And if you peek through this hole right here, there's one way you can see it. It's up there. There's the coronavirus, which of course, we can come around this way and see it too. And so Tracy, you talked a little bit about um, the techniques Yes. That, that Sue's been using, the shibori technique, and how um, she started kind of amending that to use that as decoration, at, like the process of shibori 
is now decoration in some of these works rather than uh, the outcome, just the outcome of Shibori. Right, right. Um, she is an expert at, at Shibori, which is perfect. Is, is an expert at Shibori and, and taught that for us at QSDS many times. And it's a, it's a technique where you use many, many, many small stitches to kind of gather the fabric together. Then you dye the fabric. And then once the fabric is dyed, then you take out the stitches and you have these very intricate patterns. And um, for a while, when she was in the Netherlands, she was still doing that with the parachutes that she was hanging. Since she's come here, she's realized that she is appreciating more the stitching and not wanting to remove that from, from the, the actual pieces. So kind of not doing the dyeing of it, though this piece here that is the tsunami, that is dyed, but not in the shibori technique. So yes, that's how her work has, has transformed. She's doing a lot of um, site-specific installation pieces. Uh, right now her focus is kind of relaying to the world um, we need to do something. We need to do something. We all need to do something. Um, you know, whether it's recycling your 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 own trash from your house. Even if you do something as small as that, you know, if we all do it, then it, it it'll help. Just one little thing at a time, one person at a time. And I believe that's what she's trying to convey. So the really, the, I think that there's a, an interesting play that's happening here. Um, she's defining space through letters that you could only see if you took the time to trace it with your body or knew ahead of time that it's an SOS. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I also find it really interesting that when you step away from it, it really does have this aquatic uh, feel to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, she had also made the comment that um, she knows that there are people out there who kind of um, maybe these sorts of, of things that the fires, the coronavirus, you know, right now maybe they're coming to an art exhibition or want to see the art exhibition to kind of make them feel better, to kind of comfort them because a lot of people use art in that way. And that is why she's still really drawn to using textiles because over the history, you know, textiles have been our blankets, they've been our clothes, they've been our, you know, grandma's sweater. Um, and so she feels that as she's using these materials, she's kind of speaking to both, both groups, those who want to, yeah, are like, yeah, let's do this, let's make the change, and those people who are like, oh my gosh, all this that's going on in the world, and I just, I, I need that comfort. So she really likes that duality uh, in her work at the moment. That's a, I love the, the idea of thinking about the material as a way to uh, soften delivery because of the nature of it being soft. That's really interesting. All right, let's head on over and, and talk about uh, Andrea Myers. Okay. Andrea is also another artist from Columbus that I met at uh, the Columbus College, College of Art and Design. Um, when I first met her, she was doing these um, more sculptural kind of pieces, felt that um, like a tower of felt that was kind of melting off the, the column. And um, since then, her work has changed. And um, here we can also move over here. You want to show that one? We have a, a lot of her work. This one's more of a grid coming off the wall. Shadow tangles. This one, um, she's interested also in the shadows that the bottom part creates. Using found fabrics, recycled fabrics, giving them a new life, a new shape. Then we have this big, beautiful piece, which is a combination of hundreds of pairs of denim jeans and found materials. Um, if you look up close, 
she has a lot of unfinished edges and you know crazy stitching and she feels that this kind of brings the humanity to it like we all have loose strings we all have maybe our stitching isn't quite <laughs> perfect but as we back away from the piece that all kind of fades away and what you're left seeing is this beautiful composition of color. You don't notice the edges, the frayed edges or the stitches. It becomes more of a texture, kind of part of the, part of the part of the whole. Um, one of the things I love about her too is that she's not afraid to use these colors. Um, I think there's you know a tendency to Oh, I need to use mature colors. I need to use, you know, contrasting colors. I need to use, um, you know, okay, I've used blue here. Well, let's use yellow here. And I just love that she has kind of said, you know what, I love these bright colors and I'm going to use them and I love the contrast against the denim. There's a familiarity that happens when you use uh, denim too. Mm -hmm. Like it's a, a level setting. And the, the other really interesting thing about Andrea's work is that um, there's, there is a flow to the color and how she's blocking that in. Mm -hmm. She is moving your eye through these pieces, both by design and through color. So there's mm -hmm. this uh, repetition that she's controlling. So I think about like if you walk through a Frank Lloyd Wright house and how you're pinched at places and you know big open things happen at different places it's the same thing that's happening in these works and it's really interesting it is it is and you can see in her blocks that she's made so that it's been made in smaller pieces that she's then put together and maybe you know but like in uh, unlike traditional quilts maybe the corners don't meet quite perfectly but i think that's one of the points of this piece it makes it more interesting yes and the other thing that's really interesting to think about is how heavy this piece is yeah. like if you think about you know your own pair of, of denim trousers they're you know maybe a pound or so maybe yeah. a little more depending on who you are and um this is many of those plus strings so to imagine the weight of this and getting to watch Andrea install it was also really interesting because you know you kind of have to brace your body against the wall oh, to get sure. it up there. Oh. Really physical. So you think about the physicality of her making this as well and like how large it is and how how was she able to to get this pieced together? What what room did she take over? Exactly. I love thinking about exactly. that. How do you make something this this large? Correct, right. And she uh, did comment that she is interested in, in starting to work larger. She really likes that idea. In fact, when I tried to uh, call her and talk to her the other day, she was in the process of going and visiting a site and uh, about painting a mural. So it would be, I, I believe, kind of similar to this design, but um, you know she's she's really interesting because I do find her work painterly as well, mm -hmm. very painterly. Let's pop over and have a look at that last piece as well because it absolutely yes. just hits all of those points that yes. you mentioned before. It directs you right into the yep, kind of brings you all in like you're, and then moving out the other side. And here she's used you know all the different colors of the thread as well on top and I just love her fearlessness of color and folks that are watching online feel free to ask questions whenever we're happy to, to thread them through so we're going to turn around and have a look at the installation that was created by Judy Rush. Set this down. Okay, let's start down here actually. This is where the piece begins. So Judy started out as an art quilter and um, she, all of her pieces were, you know, a rather small size. 
but they were just very compacted with stitches and she was always concerned with one color, how one color stitch would be, would interact with the next color stitch and how, um, you know, this piece of fabric would interact with this piece of fabric. And so there was always so much going on. And then from there, she found herself uh, becoming interested in quantum physics. And right now in quantum physics, they are working on trying to find the smallest particle that exists. And so she finds that uh, fascinating. And with fiber, fiber are particles. You know, that's what contemporary fiber is. They're, they're all made of single fibers, uh, paper, we have felt, we have uh, thread, we have um, fabric, um, parachutes. <laughs> And so um, she went and did a residency and started learning to wet felt. And so this piece starts out kind of in, with chaos. You see the chaos. No, that's the order. She's the order here. Oh, there's no chaos. And then here they come to order. Yeah, the nine by nine grid. They realize that that's where they want to find their order. And then she starts to introduce the bowl shapes. And the columns start interacting with those and feeling the energy. And then as we move farther, we see that they're actually beginning to create sculptures with the bowls. And the bowls are even taking on different shapes, you know, kind of wrapping around maybe trying to imitate the shapes of the columns. And as we come around, we find that they've moved to the floor and are creating other shapes and other combinations. And as I'm standing here, also with quantum physics, you know, they speak of energy and that you can put your energy in everything that you touch. Energy runs through everything. And so Judy has had her hands and her energy in every single piece. She's meshed these fibers together. And so, she, you know, she, she feels that when she stands under these, you can feel the energy of each different piece. And that's something that she's very conscious of. So at the end of all of this, at the end of the evolution and the change in energy and the, the world is changing and creating this new energy, we end up with they. And here she's kind of leaving all this behind her and starting anew kind of creating a new a new world. So you talked a little bit about the difference of how um, the sculptural, how this sculptural ending is produced. Yes, this is done with needle felting. And um, needle felting is, wet felting is, is a very um, you know, labor intensive, you need heat you need water, you need soap, and you need agitation. And so that's how all these pieces are made. When you do needle felting, um, what it is is you take tiny pieces of wool and you have a pin that has little barbs on it and you poke it. And say you wanna make that little tiny line there, you have a single needle that you poke that line through. So it's a, such an intimate um, and time-consuming um, and loving, um, you know, act to create something like this. You 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 really put everything into it, and she has. And so this is how she feels that after the chaos, and then the order, and then the mixing 
and the change in the energy that this is how we'll come out at the end. Not a, not, maybe not specifically this, but that there's going to be something new, that there's change coming. And, and that's how she feels. Wonderful. Yeah. Take yourself through that one more time. I think it feels that there's a really interesting thing. Yeah, you're going to walk. Are able to view it from either side. Yeah, I don't know if you saw in there. And that tube coming through. So we have we have a comment um, from uh, we have a comment from Stephanie Ron back to Andrea Myers' work and talking about that there's probably some context to the working class with the gene material too. Wow. I'm curious if maybe that's a part of it. And then another person. Um, Char Norman said, congrats to Judy. This is an intriguing piece and such an innovative use of felting. Oh. Um, and you can see here how she's layered the felt and how through the, the, the wet felting process, how you get the layers that come through. And those are, you know, you have some control over that. You can see her stars that she did up there. So you do have some control over what happens. But sometimes you get these beautiful, just beautiful things that happen that are happy accidents. Oh, it's great. Diane Nunez is on and says she loves the movement of the piece. I think that that was for Andrea. And uh, Connie also said that she loves the colors. So yeah, it's great. great. I love the tension that it happens with the different heights that, you know, floating in space gives you this, this sense of um, defied gravity that's really exciting. Yeah, and, I, and you know, and also these pieces that look like they're almost been destroyed, maybe that they're the pieces that couldn't handle the change. Mm. Um, you know, the, the change in the universe, the change in the energy that's um, happening right now. Or perhaps they're becoming. Or perhaps they're becoming. All right, let's come on over okay. to Amanda. Okay. And this is Amanda McCather. She's from Ontario, Canada. And these pieces are embroidery thread um, she's done thread painting, and uh, how she's done that is she's used a sol water-soluble um, fabric that you then use a free-motion sewing machine to thread paint to actually create, you know, these images. And then once you wash the water-soluble fabric out, then you what you're left with is the embroidery. Um, so she was very, and she started out drawing, and she wanted to do an experiment. What if she drew a line with thread, and how could she do that? How could she do that? So she had to figure that out on her own, where she was. She didn't have um, you know, a mentor that really knew about water-soluble fibers and that sort of thing. Um, but she's very interested in the, the, they look so fragile, but yet the grid, once you put them together, once they're all working together and they're overlapped and they are, um, you know, intertwined, that the strength that they have is, is, you know, surprising. You wouldn't think that something as fragile and uh, as, as a piece of thread could become something like this. And um, this piece as a whole is from a place that she lived uh, at one point. And her thought behind that was that, you know, there were people that lived there before her. And she wondered, well, what, what did it look like when they lived there? And she's then wondered, well, I'm not going to be here forever, so 
what's it going to look like when the people that live there after me, what's it going to look like? And then also, you know, she's moving on, and she wants to remember what it was like when she lived there. So this is a composition of this apartment that she lived in, and um, you know, these may not have all have been memories from the same time, but as she would remember them, she would put them into the composition, like maybe snowflakes, you know, that she made as she was a child, or the pictures of, of different dogs in their lives, maybe a special chair that, you know, grandpa sat in, um, her backpack from school, you know, the iron that she used, her mother used to iron. So these are her memories of a space. This is how she remembers and honors the space. Some of these pieces may be something that she imagines, you know, from the people who lived there before her. That's a really interesting comment um, because we just we just received something from uh, Kimberly Chapman that said so ethereal. The thread work looks like ghosts of objects. Oh. What an interesting and novel use of material, like objects from a haunted house. And another person said, uh, oh, what amazing work. I can't wait to learn more. Yeah, so it's, it's and it, you know, it's, it's not solid. You can see through it. You know, you see the, the, the shadows behind it. Um, but you know, when you think, and you think about memories, you know, they're, they're kind of blurry sometimes. And, um, so when you think of it that way, this totally makes sense. They're not all crystal clear, and they're not all perfect. They're kind of otherworldly when we think back on, on our memories of our childhood or places that we used to live. I also really appreciate that um, there's, there's kind of a meditation that's happening in her creation of the work. So she's meditating on these pieces that she lives with. So. Um, it gives a, when you give something that amount of time, it gives it more importance. Mm. Um, it gives you time to think about what it means to you, where it came from, and it solidifies it within your existence. And I also really appreciate the, the inclusion of the mundane, mm. like having an iron with a looped cord that was incredibly hard to do, I'm sure. Um, but to, to think to have that as a, a part of your space. And, these, right. and um, why was that important to her? Right. Yeah. Like it, we obviously. live in spaces that are not um, perfectly composed, mm -hmm. um, but this feels perfectly composed mm -hmm. with the addition of these common objects, mm -hmm. like the slumped backpack or the, the paint can with the tape next to it. It's really smartly done. And she also, you know, encourages people to look at them from different, you know, maybe from the side or from the side, you know, looking forward. In fact, after she, she says after she installs a lot of her pieces, she will lay down underneath them and look up. So um, just to get different perspective and become more part of, of, you know, this environment that was part of her, her life. She couldn't get that um, view, you know, when she was in the real room, but now, now she can. Almost more dreamlike. All right. Do you want to do 20 minutes? Okay, this piece is by Sue Benner. She is from Texas. And Sue is. Um, in a lot of her work, she um, uses a lot of vintage clothing, and uh, she will, you know, cut up the pieces of vintage clothing and collage and paint and print and sew and fuse. And um, over the years, she this is was her collection of shoulder pads from the shirts that she used in her other work. Um, there's a similar piece that was in Quilt National, the last Quilt National, that was the collars that she took off of um, the, the shirts that she used. Um, but I just love this piece because to me, this piece is, is truly Sue. I mean, this is not an easy piece to compile. I mean, to have this 
grid like this with the holes in between and to have them sewn like that, um, it, it's, that is not an easy task to do. So to me, when I say it reminds me of Sue, it's colorful, it's um, impeccable craftsmanship, uh, it's quirky, it's fun, and uh, inspirational. Um, I was also, we were also talking about um, how she refers back to tradition and the ties. And that's how they used to tie quilts together. And I also want to, we, this piece was hung away from the wall on purpose so that people could experience the beautiful shadow behind, which to me, I, I feel is almost kind of the polar opposite of, of the piece. You have the color, you have the pattern, you have the, 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 the threads, um, you know, all that. And then back here, you just have the gray, the dark gray, the white, with the overlapping shapes. So it's, it's a whole nother layer to the piece. And I believe it's part of the piece. Let's move on to Diane Nunez. Okay, Diane Nunez is from New York, and she got her start as uh, a landscape architect and a jewelry maker. So that's why I kind of brought this piece into it. This kind of, she started utilizing some of her techniques that she used when she made jewelry. Um, and she's pretty much started off doing three-dimensional. Um, it, with, it, with her jewelry, she used a lot of metal mesh. And when she was making um, quilt blocks, I have to tell this cute little story first. Um, when her son went to college, there was a quilt shop right there. And they were doing a block of the month. And she said, you know what, I'm going to do this because this is going to get me back here to visit my son once a month. So she did that. She did it for four years and she never finished a piece. Uh, but once that was done, she realized, OK, well, I really like working with this material, but how can I make it mine? And so she started working with that metal mesh and using that as like the third layer. And that gave it that dimensional um, you know, feeling that she was comfortable using because as an architect, a landscape architect, say this, this one reminds me very much of, you know, one of her drawings of a landscape yeah, because not, on. yeah, yeah, because not only do you have to think about, okay, maybe this is the grass, but then we have these, this foliage, well then in the middle, I need this foliage to be taller. And so that's how I feel, you know, that kind of came into her work as well. Um, she's also very conscious about um, shipping. She, um, you know, how, because we all know shipping is very expensive these days, but I believe it's also become part of her creative process. And I do have permission to do this. So, um, but this piece right here, called Siamese Twins, is velcroed together. So then it could be lifted, you know, doubled over and shipped that way. It can also be, you know, moved around and shown a different way. Same with this one. All of these pieces in here are velcroed together. Very well velcroed together. <laughs> So if somebody were to purchase this or if, you know, a gallery director or the installers wanted to say, you know what, I think this color would look better here, these could all be moved around because there is Velcro in between all of them. This piece can also be hung away from the wall. So it's going to 
be hung away from the wall and twist and also utilize the shadows, the beautiful shadows that are created by her work. But she was one of the first. Uh, she taught at QSDS and she was, there were a lot of people who were interested in trying to figure out, well, how can I make my work three-dimensional? And she came in and taught this technique about, you know, turn it on its side. You can do that. You're allowed to do that. You know, if your brain can think it, you can do it. And so um, I think this work inspired a lot of artists to start thinking outside the box and thinking of other ways to, to do three-dimensional work. This piece right here, called tic-tac-toe, can actually hinge at each of these. Like if you were to pull this up, it can hinge so it can become different shapes. Yeah. And this is one of her first where she has been doing some hand mark making on it, so um, which she enjoyed very much and is going to be doing more of, which I'm excited to see. There's a there's an element of um, engineering that I mean clearly articulates her personal background. Of, mm -hmm. You know, when you're an architect, you have to prop, you have to problem solve on everything. These these have that that nature to them. When you talk about how she's really interested in, in being uh, very uh, smart about how she is able to pack and like bring it down to the smallest. I think about like uh, Inspector Gadget and like right. her pieces are basically Inspector Gadget. Exactly. In the car. Um, and I think, yeah, it's yeah. this engineering feat that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and appreciated by a lot of people who do, who do shipping. Yeah. All right. Do we want to move on to the yeah. next? Okay. Next, we're going to move on to Susan Callahan, and she's from Silver Springs, Maryland. And Susan is a chef, and um, a lot of her pieces are like this. She finds beauty just as much beauty in her industrial silver kitchens, you know, that they keep clean and then they're sparkly and are so functional and um, is a place where she gets to do what she truly loves. She loves cooking. And so she, um, when she, her, her son turned 17, she actually had her first experience with um, quilting and that same week she kicked her 17 17 year old son out of his room into the basement and made a sewing room and she hasn't stopped since so um, but this is kind of she's been doing these this is her homage to all those people who are kind of behind the scenes um, giving them credit doing what they love but working so hard and dealing with all of us outside who have our special requests and and you know crazy requests i think one was she said you know somebody wants their pasta salad with the dressing on the side and um you know that's she's like we just can't do that but we you know we do what we can we do what we can and she's always been she's been interested for a while in wanting to do a prayer flag and this is her interpretation of a prayer flag. Now these are all on cotton and they are hand printed, uh, screen printed, and then she used uh, different pens to kind of write um, people's orders on them. And some of them have the crazy things, you know, that people order, you know, fish, you know, fish soup, house salad, um, you know, this without that, this. And she also has names of people who are very important to her in her life, just to, to, to honor them, to honor these people who feed us every day. So we have a comment from Marianne Tipple who said, Art quilting has very much expanded the surface by adding the shadow it creates as a part of the art, and it's potentially 
adds texture and tension on the surface at the same time. So happy to be included in the show. Thank you, Mary. Miss you. <laughs> um, another great thing about this piece is um, now on these pieces here, she uses um, textile paints, dyes. Well, on these pieces, this is mustard, ketchup, barbecue sauce, hot sauce. Um, you know, the things that you know, at, when a waitress or you know, a chef is, or they're taking orders and you don't know what's gonna get on them. So this is the kind of things they have to deal with. And she wanted to use the real, the real deal when she made this. So if you get up close, you can kind of smell the mustard and the ketchup and the <laughs> hot sauce and the... <laughs> and Debbie Griffin said, Tracy Rieger is doing an amazing job connecting us to these pieces virtually. No easy task. Oh, thank you, Deborah. And this is another piece by Amanda Gavern. And this is another, this is called Stand In For Home. Um, you have to go and show us that you can stand in the window. Oh, yes. So it is away from the wall. So you can become a part of peace. Yeah. So she can feel like she's at home. But it's just a stand in. It's not the real thing, but sometimes even things that aren't the real thing help. And this is the same technique, the embroidery on the water soluble, on the water soluble fabric that you then wash. After she washes it, then she has to stretch the pieces to get them into the correct shape that she wants them to be. And when she ships them to us, she, um, she actually lays them all flat on a piece of paper rolls them up and sends them in a tube, which is a great idea because I was thinking, how did she, how will she, <laughs> without getting holes in them. But I love how the flowers are just floating a little bit, you know, making it is, it is dreamlike. The beautiful yellow roses some with more detail than others. So we have one more artist that we're going to look at. So if anybody has questions, make sure that you type them in so we can get to them. And I'll let you get to the last artist. Okay. Last but not least. And this artist is Jiang Chung. And she is from Rhode Island, originally from Korea. And these pieces are called Chuchi. And they are made of mulberry paper that is felted. Um, and when I say felted, it's not like the wool, but it's the same technique. It's water and agitation. Um, so when she would teach, she taught for us at QSDS. And um, you know this class takes dedication because in order to get these beautiful shapes and holes and, and strings, you have to do a lot of agitation. So, um, you know, we have six hours of class a day, um, but you would see the people in her class carrying around their little tubes of, um, of their, you know, jun chi, and at lunch they'd have them under the table, maybe rolling them with their feet, or when we were having a lecture in the evening, uh, they'd be all in a group kind of over there, you know, in the back so they wouldn't bother the rest of us. And um, But it's, it's a beautiful, it's a traditional um, technique. Back then they used uh, jun chi uh, to make clothes, it, um, because it's a very sturdy, once you get it to this texture, very sturdy. And so they actually used it as clothing. Um, so Tracy, does, the, does it start as a single piece of paper? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and so then the agitation, nature takes its course and creates these 
um, you can't calculate these holes, right? Not really. I think, you know, of course, since Jeong has been doing this for so long, she's kind of figured that out more. Um, but um, there's chance to it. Yes, there definitely is chance. Yeah, yeah. And I think she does so many pieces that she's then able to kind of layer them which with what pieces look best with what pieces. Um, so this is, you know, her, this is her bringing her tradition and making it contemporary. And there's also one other thing I have to show. This is a piece that I own of Jeong's. And um, I just have to show her genius way that she um, displays them. So what it is is this is a magnet. And there are two metal brackets you just screw into the wall. It, actually, they don't even have to be even, really. <laughs> and you magnet it up there. And there it is. And that way, you also get the beautiful, I mean, look at these gorgeous shadows that you can get behind her work with the lines and the circles and the edges and just beautiful. And she teaches for us every other year at KSDS as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So if we don't, we'll give it a couple more seconds to see if anyone comes up with any additional questions. Okay. Well, if while we're waiting, I just would really like to thank you and the Wright and the Ohio Arts Council for letting me curate this exhibition um, in this incredible space and for the artists and for their amazing work. Um, you know, my, the part of my job that I do with this is it's easy. I'm like a kid in a candy shop. I, you know, oh, I want that artist and that artist and that artist. And, and um, but the magic that happens when they all come together. Um, I wish, I wish we could all be here to see it because I'm just really proud of all of you and all the work that has gone into this. Kimberly Chapman said, what a show, really well curated and reviewed, thank you so much. Heather Markson said, thank you for such a wonderful tour. Sean Norman, amazing show. Thanks, Kat, Tracy, and all the artists. Lisa Cooper, thank you so much for this, it was excellent. So the thanks go right back to you, it really is a phenomenal show, and so glad that we can have it here at the Ohio Arts Council's Reich Gallery, um, a unique gallery that's supported by our legislature. So. Just shout out to the legislature for supporting such important things as the arts, yes. the visual arts, and keeping them going. So I hope you all are making, creating, consuming the art, um, and enjoying your long week. Well, it's not a long weekend, but your weekend. Yes. So take care, everyone. Thank you so much.